Okay, so um, ahead, just a reminder fine. for everybody to please silence your cell phone. We've got a contribution by one of our citizens. It's a little jar up there with a slot in the top. So um, if the phone goes off, we're going to start collecting funds for the Sarah Maud Mason um, boardwalk fund. <laughs> so. I'd also like to remind everybody to please be courteous to your fellow citizens. When they're speaking, please keep your comments um, to yourself until it is your, it's your time to speak. We want to make sure that we are respectful of everyone. Thank you. So the, fir the first item on the agenda is the consideration um, and approval to execute the progressive inspection agreement. That was, we tabled it uh, last meeting on the 14th because we had a typo in it and um, counselors needed additional time to review and um, ingest the information. So, so moved. Second. Okay. So, discussion. Yes, uh, like I brought up the last meeting, um, there, I know we put an RFP out when Mayor Nebel was the mayor, and we were looking at bringing in other contracts. I know uh, Alpha gave me one. I think uh, Councilman Conroy stated he got one from another company. And uh, I was wondering how we veered away from that and not opening up just to look at other contracts and look at other opportunities, especially with the uh, uh, complaints we got from builders and residents and we had that one meeting where they, they stood up and spoke about some of their concerns. So I want to first ask whatever happened to that. Why won't, would it hurt to entertain it? The RFP was premature. Um, we had already had an RFP with responses. Um, the county uh, withdrew from contention. They, they didn't want to participate when we met back. Alpha didn't provide a lot of information. And so we were working with Progressive. In fact, you were working with Progressive with Ron Frank for a while, yeah. right. right for a while and then um, that went over to um, the then mayor Giebel who uh, offered a 30-day extension to work through the kinks on the contract so um, during the uh, absence of uh, mayor Giebel at that time uh, I took on that responsibility incorporated your notes and moved forward with the, the selection with the active participant of that RFP process at okay. that time. And so um, I'm, I know that you had uh, said that you were going to pass on any uh, emails, etc., complaints to Mr. Ernest uh, so that he could address those because you now building inspection is under public services. Yeah, so. and also Mr. Von Frankenstein, because um, I made the accusations that he made some statements and I offered to give him a copy of those and he never, he never uh, came to see me or sent me an email, text message, phone call to see. Did you send them to Mr. Ernest? No, but uh, Mr. Bob, I guess I want them. Uh, I'll send them to Mr. Ernest. No, yes, know, in fact, that was my understanding, yes. was that you were going to send everything to Mr. Ernest for review and discussion and for Mr. Ernest to address them. Okay. Frank Bob, Frank Einstein, Mr. And, and also, I remember I brought this up when the builders came up with their concerns with Mr. Von Frankenstein. And I know uh, a new House bill was passed this year. I think it was uh, House Bill uh, 7103. And what that does, it gives options to builders if they're not happy with their uh, the services of the town building inspector. They can go outside. Right. And, uh, and they're seriously entertaining that if we take on this contract. Um, what would that do to us? We lose a lot of money coming into the town. And if they start the Talachay project, is that what in Florida have? Talachay? Yes, Florida. Yeah. Um, the town will lose a substantial amount of money. The um, permits would still come through our town. You'd lose a lot of money, though. You'd lose a substantial amount of money. I think it was 75%. Um, I don't want that happen, so I said, you know, there's amount of revenue coming in. So. Uh, that was brought to my attention by the builder, so we should seriously look at that as well um, before we move forward, because we don't want them using someone else. Well, my understanding from them was that we had uh, certain items to address, um, making sure that the inspection inspector was available during business hours, yep. um, making sure uh, that the uh, process was automated as far as we could, um, that there weren't uh, final uh, sign-offs 
via text and that sort of thing. And I know that um, Mr. Ernest and Mr. Frank von Frankenstein have that list. I also know that those builders confirmed that they thought that um, he was an incredibly good inspector and thought that the quality of the housing that we have here in Howie was primarily due to his management of the inspection process. And I think that that is something we don't want to lose, that we want to be known and continue to have that expertise um, on our staff or available to us. And, I, and that has actually always been the case where if somebody doesn't want to work with our building inspector, they can go elsewhere. Yes. That has always been the case. So I do know of a couple of instances of that. And, I, and they did mention that um, as they spoke about their concerns, and they did compliment on that. I think the, the concerns outweighed that. Yes, they did say that, but there were more concerns and, and uh, other than uh, we're, we're assured that he's keeping an eye on the building and making sure we're, uh, they follow the codes and they're built well. But there was a lot more complaints than uh, compliments. But once again, I just want to bring that to your attention. Uh, it should be taken into consideration when we vote, as well as the outside uh, opportunity of inspectors coming in and us losing the money. This is also an, uh, year, an annual contract. Yeah. So if we do validate that this year, we have the opportunity to review it and um, make a decision with the time. I think there's a clause in there as well that we can actually yes. opt out of it halfway through the contract based on certain criteria. I believe it's, uh, isn't it, Heather, 60, 60 days? 60 days? Yep. So it's not even halfway through the contract. Yeah. It's just a mutual. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we have that. We have a contract yet, so you can't count the days. That, <laughs> no, no. That's exactly right. And the other concern I had was obviously the reinspection fees. Um, and when I was meeting with them, it was 100% to him and zero to us. Uh, I recommended 50 50. I think when I last left him, it was 60 40. And I think it's 80 20. 80 20 him. So I just thought it sh should even out um, to 50 50. Well, as we discussed last time with the 80 20. Um, I looked at the scope of the work for the re-inspections um, and what was entailed, and I do believe that the AD20 is appropriate to the effort that's put in. So. Um, guys, covered pretty much everything. Um, my thoughts is that we've had many years of successful inspecting with, with Mr. Uh, with Ron. He's ex no one argues how knowledgeable he is about the codes. Matter of fact. Uh, his knowledge sometimes means he knows them better than the builders, and um, uh, and I, I really, when I selected vendors in my other lives, it was always when somebody could say you end up, as one of the gentlemen said, Howie has better houses because of Mr. Von Frankenstein, and I think I don't know what better cop they make. They you can't have the foxes. Uh, controlling the hen house. And while we do have good builders, and I guess many of the people who have recent homes could probably comment on the quality of the buildings, but the last thing we want is any decline in the quality of building in Howard. So, and the fact he reports to Mr. Ernest. Um, as far as the 8020, as he's been a consultant, which basically Ron is, or any of our consultants are, is that, you know, you're buying your own car, you're paying your own insurance, all those, there's, you're about 50% in the hole and every dollar you make before you even start looking at other at other things. So, and in the years in the years where we had no building, I think one year we had only one. Uh, Ron didn't receive any money because there was there was no inspections or there were very few inspections. I do not have the exact number. So if you look at his past history, that he had the zero years, and now the last couple of years has been pretty good. And in the future, it's probably going to decline again until we have some other development started. So. I'm very much in favor of renewing our contract with Ron um, because he's done a great job. He's not perfect, by the way. <laughs> as, as a human being. As and, an inspector. And I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comment? Call a question. <laughs> No. Councilor McGill? No. Mayor McFarland? Yes. Mayor from 10 Conroy? <laughs> yes. Councilor Diefel? Yes. 
It sounds Thanks. like a terrible number when you say 40, 40 million gallons over, but it's not a drop in the bucket of what you, we use and the other towns use. It just sounds awful. And St. John's River Water Management District is also considering reducing the allocation per person. Yes. Um, so even if our, uh, our population goes up, if they move forward with this change in the gallons per person per day, and our cups could see. <laughs> so we really have to look at that and, and work through that process. That's something we cannot control. That is a state mandate. So, um, Mr. Ernst, the other thing you want to talk about, um, I want to skip to your report. Uh, it's item number 10 in the, the book. It's about the trees. Sure. Our report for this month is we give you just eight items. We completed the replacement of 19 outdated fire hydrants in the town uh, with a savings of $64,000 from the original contract. We painted all the hydrants in Venetia that are in the right now. Installed 10 new water meters, 5 potable and 5 irrigation. Uh, we repaired, we repaired, uh, replaced 5 old curb stops. That means that on the main is a valve. The old valves in town were hand valves. They rusted away. We replaced at least one a week because they break. Uh, we replaced the chlorine pump at well 3. It doesn't mean anything to you, but it does on your drinking water. We replaced a 6 inch broken sewer line in Venetia. That was done months ago by a contractor. We have all the information on that. Well, we removed the one oak tree on South Lakeshore that fell on a truck. Uh, the picture, yeah, so you have the picture on the packet. Mm -hmm. Plus, we took down, uh, I believe, five, yes, five ear trees, uh, four ear trees, which were rotten in the core and pretty close to falling. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think that's the extent of what you need to be here for if you want to go, unless you want to be here for Bishop Kate later. You want to do Bishop Kate? Um, I don't think Ben is here yet. Yeah. Oh, yes, Ben, excellent. Can you come up, please? Sure. I apologize for all the skipping around, but I think we'll, we'll be okay. <laughs> it's number four in the new business section. Mayor, I brought a compare version of what we looked at on the 14th to what we have now, if that's helpful. Can you pass around? That's the line version so that we can see exactly what's changed here. Motion first. Motion first. We did a motion first? Yeah, we can. So okay. move to uh, approve the race water agreement. Sorry. I'm sorry. Now we can discuss. This is the line guide. The um, agreement was in the packet, but this is the item that identifies what was changed. The red line there. So, um, as we had discussed at the meeting on October 14th, we changed the uh, agreement so that it removed uh, ownership of the line along. Uh, is it County Road 48? County Road 48 uh, between Bishop, uh, Bishop's Gate and uh, where they're going to bore under the road to connect to the CDD. Uh, we had discussed the liability uh, for the town and uh, as a council agreed that we did not want ownership of that line because it had no benefit in the future. None of the other developments or the other development on Lake Hill uh, would connect to it because it is too small. And, and we, excuse me. Um, really didn't have uh, any responsibility or, um, and it was also on the DOT land. Excuse me. So <clears throat> we've gone forward with an agreement that takes out that um, ownership and uh, currently uh, in our, we don't have in our uh, charter or in our ordinances, in our ordinances, any of the uh, fee components for wastewater. And so the idea is to charge um, Bishopsgate the same amount that we're currently charging any of our residents that are connected to the CDD. And Mayor, if I may add, there is a statute that says that you will charge the same amount to a <coughs> development or property owner that's outside of your town boundaries. And so, I think if you wanted to entertain an idea of charging an amount that's less, since the statute is specific that you can only charge the same, 
or more, that you would need to do a study um, and justify a lower rate for everyone. Yeah, I don't, I, that's probably fine. Not take this out. Ben, how many how many units would come on year one, year two, roughly? We don't hold you to it. Yeah, sure. There's we would 84 units would come online, and there's proposed you know, in the agreement it's going to be billed per ERU, so it'd be 84 units being billed from month one, ideally June of next year. And uh, to the really, I came this evening to, to discuss really that, that retail portion of that because as, a, as Bishop's Gate we're to, it makes sense for us to build and own and, and maintain and repair the entire system we're all in agreement with that when the neighboring land opted a year and a half to whenever it was to opt out of any potential pioneering or future connection it became an independent system for Bishop's Gate so really the only future ERUs that will come online are within the Bishop's Gate community. I mean, up to 204, 205, so a significant number, but still just the ones in the community. And so we're great with we being the HOA. I'm speaking on behalf of the Bishop's Gate HOA when I say we, because that's the, that's the party. Um, we're fine with that. We're fine to own and maintain and repair the entire system. Um, the idea came up, though, where we are, as an HOA, respectful of the existence of retail rates as you know as they function within within municipalities communities others with the change of taking the pipe from town ownership and responsibility to HOA ownership and responsibility we were hoping to find a mechanism to take a portion of that retail rate and put it in some type of non-touchable escrow for maintenance and repairs of that line only so brought you know high level still paying the retail rate, no no issue there, but it didn't make logical sense to pay the retail rate and not have, and just sort of have that money go away and not have something set aside, whether that's 20% of the difference between the what the town pays for wholesale and retail, whatever that number is, that wouldn't be, I don't think, necessarily appropriate for discussion, I'm happy to, but um, that was the, that's the idea, is can we, can we identify a mechanism where High level, we're paying the retail rate, same as everyone. We own, maintain, repair, but a portion of that retail or a portion of that delta between wholesale and retail goes into a non-touchable escrow only for that line, only for from our property line to where it connects to Mission Inn, because everything internally to the community has, from day one, been Bishop's Gate responsibility. So that's really the only, the only outstanding question in our mind, everything else. So I... Um what does everybody think of that? The, so what we, were, we are saying is that um, they would pay the retail rate, but um, the town would then hold some monies, a portion of that um, money that they're paying, in an account, and they would be able to draw on that for repair of that line if there were a break or an issue with it. And so we would have to determine what percentage is appropriate for that. Yeah, a lot of things were discussed here. Yeah. Uh, scenarios. But what's changed, I think, is that they are responsible for 100. You know, John, and I'm speaking for John, but his biggest concern was once we got that line from their property to the manhole in Michigan, that somehow we would be pulled into spending our time, our money, our resources, and so we negotiate the deal where they own that line now. And so basically, I, it's kind of like an ideal customer. There are no, there are no costs. There's just a revenue stream, and to the people in the audience, it's about, uh, about 20, that's why I asked if, if we have 80, my math's right, we have 84 times $22 a month, it's about uh, $22,000 a year revenue for help maintain our sewers. Net, net revenue. Net revenue, yeah. yeah. So it, you know, it's, not, it's not a bad deal, it's a good deal for Howie. It's just whether or not um, the complications of if there's something to be fixed or not. And to your point, Ben, um, how, how big does that fund have to get? Let's say there are no issues <laughs> for five years or 10 years. Good yes, question. Yes, yeah, no, no, and, and 
The answer is I don't know, but a couple a couple suggestion mechanisms. Maybe it's in an escrow, an interest bearing escrow account, where once it reaches fifty or hundred grand, the interest is going to be enough to handle any repairs that are going to come up, and then the capital just sits there until the line itself needs to be replaced in fifty, sixty, seventy, how, however many years. So maybe we just treat the interest as as repair and operation, and the base capital that's ever been contributed for those decades as a line replacement. Um, you know, again, still owned and responsibility of the HOA, just with that, with that agreed right. So and that's kind of the sinking fund, basically. Exactly, that's the term we were throwing around. Yeah. <laughs> so, Heather, can you take that away? And do you have any um, precedents or any? You know? No, but I will create the <laughs> contractual provision. Thank you. <laughs> is it? Yeah, I, this kicks the can again, Ben. Is that? <laughs> well, what? It's kind of hard to negotiate something <laughs> and have legalese. I don't know when your start date is. <laughs> no, well, our, our start our start date was two was two weeks ago from today. But but that but I'm acknowledging on behalf of the HOA that 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 the time from then to now has nothing to do with the town of Howie. Now, if we get this provision set and we're ready to go, done, moved over, you know, with it, moved on. Um, we'll, we'll start the project. If you have, if the council has parameters for me, we can agree to the agreement and perhaps ask for public comment on that. And then if you want to approve the agreement this evening, subject to me working out the language and the parameters with Ben and his attorney. Yeah, that, that way it's done. And that would be, I would agree with that. And if we just want to put up a hundred thousand, up to a hundred thousand dollars, Ben, you just need to tell me how you want it to work. I would so if it's, I would propose a percentage of the town's net between wholesale and retail. That way, if you guys ever get wholesale pressure, I, I want I'm, we we as each other we want to remove any risk or any future compression of margins for you or anything like that. So, a percentage of the difference between wholesale and retail, twenty percent, goes into an escrow or a sinking fund. Um, the capital stays in there indefinitely until the line needs to be replaced, moved, whatever the case is, and any interest from that could be used for repairs and maintenance. That seems pretty would, would seem simple to me. Okay, up to a hundred thousand dollars for the. I mean, the, the line we're we're paying the line itself from from that manhole to the community today is costing us two hundred twenty grand. Okay. So I would say I would say I would say two hundred. Two hundred. Yeah. Okay. All right. I like one other thing. Um, it makes me feel. John kind of said, "What happens if we're the only ones there to help them?" You know, I kind of like a black. And they call them a black swan, or what we don't know that we don't know is that they also could use that fund to pay the town to make a to use our resource for something. I can't even imagine what it would be, but that that escrow fund would be available for us. If we're the only ones that could help them, because they may have their own contractors, but somehow they can't get there, and you got 84 people sitting over there without sewers, and then John's forced to do something, that the little provision that said that escrow account is to pay for repairs, etc., including any expenses as a town, and that way, that way we can go to sleep at night going, okay, we're getting, we're getting that fee every month, and we have maintain our no risk policy, if you will. Homeless insurance. Yeah. Homeless security. That a year from now, if it, something fails, that, that line fails, that is a way to pay for it, other than out of our coffers. Yeah. So we have. Because a year from now, they would have two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And I'd, and I'd love it if, if we didn't have a cap on that capital amount, both for the sake of the town, and then maybe the provision is when the line is replaced, if there's a couple hundred grand sitting over then, then the town can sort of scoop that and then the whole process starts over. Okay. Type of thing. Okay. So no cap then. And we're still a win-win all the way around. Any like other comments? Tell you what that line would cost to replace in five years, and I want to become a stockbroker. <laughs> Seven shares. Is there any public comment on this? Yes. Are you going to... Can you say your name and address, oh, yes. please? My name is Jennifer Hall. I'm 
My name is Denise Howard, and I live at 444 Belusio no Place in Halloween Hills. And besides this escrow that you're asking us to take out of the money that we're supposed to get, are you yourself as an HOA going to have any funds whatsoever to help with that? Or is this the only amount of money that's going to be available for anything that happens to your system? So, on, good question. Under the agreement, we as an HOA are responsible for owning and maintaining and paying for everything within our community. Uh -huh. That's been envisioned for ages, and we have the, the, we have a service agreement in place. Mm -hmm. We have the finances to do so. We have that. This would, is only for this exterior, this external line. Only for the external line. Yeah, a hundred only for the external line. But are you yourself as an HFA just under this scenario? We wouldn't escrow anything additional for the external line. No. Okay. We would handle still handle. But you but out. you would have your own escrow for your system. Are you going to build up an escrow for your systems? Definitely. Just, just like in, just like our roads or just like our pool or, or anything. It will be another line item in those. Yes. Okay. Yep. Mr. Miles. Who's going to compute this amount every month, every quarter, every year? Is it going to be done by the public service director? Is every single contract you do going to have its unique little terms? And then you're going to have somebody... When you consider the audit report later, you may note some of the repeat findings in there related to the weakness of your finance and administrative staffs. This is just an example of the type of thing that usually falls on the finance and administrative staff. And if every single time somebody does something, you've got all sorts of unique little things written into the agreement, you've just complexed it up tremendously. I'm fine with annually from our side. I can't see who it is, but there's a hand up back there. Uh, Cynthia Smith, 308 North Palm Avenue, Howie Can it, Ben, do you think we could get that? Thank you so oh, much. I'm just going to enlist you right here. I didn't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I just, my name is Cynthia Smith, 308 North Palm Avenue, Howie in the Hills, Florida. I just wanted to know what the benefit would be of handling this situation any differently than you would handle a pool or any of the other areas in Mission, um, in your subdivision. So, um, also what the benefit to the town would be to act as a bank, because that's sort of what it sounds like we're acting as. So currently, yeah, thank you, uh, currently we are, um, Bishop's Gate is in our 180 for the CDD, and so it's our responsibility to manage at least the administrative function, the billing function, of the um, connection of Bishop's Gate to the CDD um, through the same mechanism that we currently use for all of our in-town residents, just because of the location that they're in that 180. Um, it is a complexity that we hadn't discussed until today to manage that fund. Um, the other option is to reduce the, the fee or increase depending on uh, the appropriate um, take on the amount of effort that we're putting in and the amount of ownership and responsibility that Bishop's Gate has, we would have to then do some sort of a study to understand what the uh, appropriate rate would be and allow Bishop's Gate to manage their own escrow, et cetera. So um, we, we have to make that decision whether we're going to uh, do a study to determine the appropriate rate or whether we're going to um, have a contract that includes some sort of an escrow value for it. And there is nothing uh, that says that we can't start out with the escrow and then uh, revise the agreement at a time uh, such that we can do the study and turn the escrow back over. Hmm? We would have to hire somebody. We would have to pay for it. Any other comments? Okay. So we have a motion and a second, but we have also decided that we are going to uh, change the scope of the document at this point, or discussed including the escrow value in um, 
the uh, agreement. So, what would you like to do? Go ahead. Do we have the option of bringing it back after we make the changes and recommendations? We absolutely do. I would recommend we do that. Okay, well, yeah. Yeah. So we weeks for meeting. Yeah. So you, we, we had a motion that. in a second to um, accept the agreement. So now we're going to vote to not accept the agreement. Well, to table it. No, we're, oh. we already had a motion in a second okay. to, to entertain it. To but we don't know if we don't have the agreement. That's right. That's right. So we should vote to table. I accept. I don't no, think no, he no, didn't make it. No, no, no. no. We have an open motion, motion right now. Yeah, we have a motion to second yeah. discussion. It's on them to. I move we table it. Okay. I'll second motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. So we're going to table this. We'll put it on the next agenda as soon as we figure out what Yeah, I, I think we'll be good to get it done next agenda. And then just let me know because I know that Monday is, I think, Veterans Day. So That's just right. Just let me know how that meeting works. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Is Representative Sabatini still here? I'm sure. He left. He left. <clears throat> yes, thank you. We're back on the agenda now. Item number three was the there is the discussion to um, create and establish a charter review committee. Um, we did not determine how best to um, find people for that committee or for that board. And so, and we have, we also have to establish the board through resolution. So um, I have heard previously through other uh, governments that they, um, each counselor goes out and solicits the participation of two or three candidates. Um, I'd like ideas. Sorry. Is that like the one that Heather passed out to us already? No, this one. It's very simple, Mayor. Yeah, this kind of fits with, Matt, you've looked at stuff too. This kind of fits with other towns have done. And that's actually within our charter too, that process. Gives me a question I was, and it's open to the to discussion. Is it five five members or seven? Uh, seeing you want a bigger cross section, but and then how do you choose those others? Well, it's just a follow that I may be the long town council, so there's five of us. Yeah, but sorry. Thank you. No, I, I, it's just would it be better to have like up to seven? Or leave it at five, which I, I can live with either. I just thought maybe a few extra brains working on it. Yeah, I, I think the more we can get, the better. Um, also, if you do a cross section around town, not from just a certain section of town. So, if we can section up town and get so many people from certain sections to get them on the board, that'd be great. Um, but we allow each complement. Would you say recruit? Who is it? If each council person would like to choose one person, and then maybe the council as a whole chooses two with to get applications, I, I don't just don't know. Yeah, yeah, some things I read, I mean, I, I think if we all went out and got two applicants each, this way we have something to pick from, and then we can go from there rather than just bringing one in. Well, isn't the town already kind of in the most sections, like Griffin Park and... Uh, they are, we do have... Um, Right, we do have um, subdivisions within the town, but not all of the houses. For example, there's a section on the west side that isn't included in any subdivision. It's yeah, just like there. Yeah. So, and, and if people would be able to volunteer like any other committee, and then we bring in two names, and then everybody gets one, and then the last two would be voted at, voted at large. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's where you were going. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I, I, definitely, me, sir. Yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely think we should move on it though. Um, you know, we have elections coming up in 2020, and yeah. I know the townspeople want to vote for their mayor, so it's something we really got to <laughs> move on since we have a strong mayor town charter and we're working under a weak town mayor uh, rules with yeah, the state. Exactly. So yeah. keep in mind if you go to a strong mayor, well, that's for the committee to decide. Yes. <laughs> One reason, the, what, my reading was council stays out of it until we approve. 
whatever goes on, but you stay out of it because we're by beast political, and theoretically the committee is going to be less political. So when, so do we have a motion? I move that we uh, proceed you to amend. Is that what we need to do here? We can, it just can be a discussion item, and okay. I can bring back a resolution if you like, based on what you just discussed. Or a council member can prepare the resolution, however you would like to do it. And then you can talk about it at the next meeting and have vote on it and have public comment on it. I do believe, Sorry, ma I believe that Darian um, started drafting a resolution okay. for that. So um, I'll contact her when she gets back. And if not, then we'll look at something and then have you review it and find it. Okay. Well, whatever you can recommend to move uh, forward the fastest, because obviously the holidays are coming up. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to have as many meetings. So whatever we can do to get those applicants in and, and start this process. On the first better. meeting of next month, it should be totally doable. And then, yeah, we can choose the committee. Maybe they have first meeting in January, but they can set the, a, an agenda. I'm thinking of, you don't want these meetings over Christmas and Thanksgiving, but you can have everything together. This is to get ready for the second yeah. meeting in January, basically. Yeah. Is there any cost to us other than just printing it up once they, we decide to change whatever we're going to Yes, do? there's quite a bit of cost for, the, not for the charter review specifically, but for um, getting it on the ballot for voting. That That's quite a large expense. No, it's, if you actually, didn't I read your thing? If I you, believe it depends on whether you're going to go for a special election. Sometimes your supervisor of elections will allow you to use their general election <coughs> ballot. Okay. And it just depends on what your supervisor of election says. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we will confirm It can be that free if it's in the general election. Maybe. If yeah, it's, yeah. And one estimate, in other words, $8,000 if right. you have a your own special election. Yes. Yeah. And those ordinances and other things. Yeah, from what I read, it, it doesn't take too long once you get the committee together to come up with something. So if we start the process in January, um, even if we're allowed to have some kind of special election in May or June, this way, when November comes around, um, the people have an opportunity, if it comes to that, as far as voting for a strong. So um, I'm, you said you want a special election in May or June, or you want to wait till November when it can be on the ballot? I'm saying if what I've read, they've they've gotten committees together and come to a conclusion within a couple of months and have it ready to present to the county to ask for a special election in May or June to find out what that cost is, uh, that varies. Sure. Um, so okay. it's something we want to research. Because it was, also, I've seen you've done some research. Is like, do they charge per each one that we change, or is it all one section? Like, we, if we change 10 things, do we get charged for 10, or do we get charged for just one lump sum? Those are good questions. I don't really know. We, that is research that needs to be done so we understand. Um, if there, the, the charter really needs a good review. Oh, I know it, it does. It is 15 years old, and um, there are some things on it that are very antiquated and really need to be addressed. So I agree 100% with that. So um, this is far overdue, and let's just get it done. So. Bottom line is, for the next meeting, there will be a resolution that we can vote on. And there to is to establish be, the, the board. Is there one meeting in November or two? That's our. Um, that's one of our next items. Um, Before we move any further, six. should we, yes. we all agree on five or seven? I, 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 I think we, yeah, so uh, I think we decide on that once we bring our applicants, you know, we might, you know, we're going to present 10 people. The ordinance has to be specific, though. So I would number. suggest you make your resolution yeah. specific, and you could, but you could also revise it at the next meeting and approve it at the next meeting, too, right? If you decide you want to go a different mm -hmm. route. Is it a resolution or an ordinance? Every you want to do. I would suggest you do a resolution <laughs> yeah. rather than so, advertising and ordinance and yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> Okay, so I think we're good with that. And I will find out um, if Darian has drafted anything and what's available. If she hasn't, we'll try to draft something. Else. So number five is the um, Lake County Sheriff Office audit of the Howie Police Department. Um, the auditor is not here. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody had access to that audit, and if we would like it to be presented or gone through in detail, we have that option. I can call the officer, and he will come and, and present all of the findings to us. And I 
I was quite pleased with the audit. There were a couple of findings, but at the end, he basically said, you know, I think you should go for accreditation. So I thought that was a uh, fine endorsement of the... Don't forget he the said that was the next step. Don't forget the new facility. Yeah, yes, the new facility was in there, the request for the new facility. <laughs> and you have a copy of that? It's, it was online. Okay. The, the audit was online. So it, it's okay. here. Thanks. So please take a look at that. It's, it's a very, I thought it was quite a good audit. And please let me know if you'd like me to invite the officer to the next meeting, you know, when we are looking for agenda items. Okay, number six. Number is the November and December um, town council meeting dates. We have conflicts with the first one. It's Veterans Day on November 14th. And we have been known to have a meeting on the Tuesday. It's 11? Sorry. Can't do anything without your phone, so you say three. Should we skip it, or do we have uh, enough to, because the 11th is Veterans Day, and then the 25th is Thanksgiving week. I think we have to have it. Um, I think a good recommendation to do that. The Tuesday? So can everybody be here on November 12th, the Tuesday, for the meeting? I can. Yep. Councilor Mabel, can you be here? I'll try. Then we would move Thanksgiving to... The, well, we have to just decide if we're going to have that one or not. Um, so we've decided, is that true? That we're going I'm to fine with uh, Tuesday. Um, can we wait to Tuesday to see how much business we get done at that meeting to see at that point um, if we have to move to Thanksgiving? We can. Mayor, um, I will have a conflict and we'll not be able to send anybody else. Either we have Windermere and Pastatula that night. On Tuesday? Sorry, yes. Your calendar. Your calendar. Your calendar. Your calendar. Your calendar. So what do we defer? We currently have on um, Tuesday we have the bishops. We decided we were going to look at the bishop's gate agreement. Um, we moved to the 18th that way. Legal's there, everybody's there, and it's the one meeting of the month. Because of the following week is Thanksgiving. But I mean, that's Monday the 18th. I can't, can't do it. Uh, 19th. And do you have to... Hmm? Well, 19th would work for me. 19th would work for you. Does the 19th? 19th works for me. <laughs> Mayor, or Mr. Ebel, is the 19th okay for you? I'm not going anywhere. Okay. You tell me what book should there lay out the schedule, and I'll be here. Okay, so um, we are going to then change the schedule for November to a single meeting on November 18th. 19th. 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 Tuesday is the 19th. Because you can't be here on the 18th. Okay, so the 19th is a good day. Yeah. Yes, we'll make sure that they He just said let, let us know, because I did tell him earlier that we were going to discuss the date and time. Now, do we want to, <coughs> since we're here looking at calendars, look at December as well? So the town council meeting would be the 9th. We have the normal town council meeting, and then the second one is the 23rd. We traditionally don't have the second, second meeting in December. Okay. No, so the first one is what? The 9th. The 9th, which shouldn't be in anybody's travel. Right. The 23rd gets into it. Right. Okay, so we're going to go to a single meeting in December as well on the 9th. Number seven is the discussion and approval to accept our financial audit. And is she here? Oh, 
And so um, she has had a previous appointment and is going to get here as soon as she can. And she said probably between 6.45 and 7. So she push it off until she gets here? Yeah. We've been, we're juggling today. Okay. Yeah. So the town hall report. I'm going to discuss that because the only thing on the town hall report is the Christmas festival. And so when that time comes, I'll get up and talk. It's now it's here. It's <laughs> Francis O'Keefe Wagler, 409 West Central Avenue. Um, the only thing on the town hall report is the Christmas festival, which is uh, the Friday, December 13th, and Saturday, December 14th. There will be more information about it in the Howie Tribune, so please open your Howie Tribune and read it. Um, if you would like to be a crafter, a participant crafter, uh, please fill out the form. Uh, Town Hall has the form. Five bucks. Thank you. <laughs> Who's running up fines? <laughs> Pretty busy. Uh, still are pretty busy. You know, a lot of things. Um, just so y'all are aware, we had a slip and fall in front of the library over the weekend. They notified me late Sunday, so I had the officer take a report. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, please. So I will get that report finalized. And Bring it over tomorrow so we can submit to Wayne Church just in case. Thank you. So there's no, uh, we already heard from Mr. Ernest, uh, the code enforcement is, um, we have not filled that position as of yet. Uh, so we're still looking for code enforcement. Uh, Tara is. Are we getting new applications in right now? Can we advertise it? We have advertised, it's out on the internet in a couple of locations. And I know we extended it to include um, the villages and uh, that area as well, in case we could get a retiree that was interested in the position. But we haven't had any applicants that have come through. They, I know that the um, responses were supposed to go to uh, Darian, and so we might hear more when she comes back. Okay. Town attorney. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this evening I was going to address or give you a status on the Venezia de-annexation and then also address the First Amendment right memo that I gave to, that I sent out. Um, for the Venezia de-annexation, we went ahead and confirmed that the qualified voters um, signed the petition. So the next step now is for the feasibility study to be done by the town. That has been started. We have um, my partner, Tom Cloud, is handling this project for us. He is one of the best annexation, de-annexation attorneys in the state of Florida, so he knows this stuff here. Um, and one thing that I wanted to point out to everybody, I know there was, there have been some questions from Venezia folks about what happens if they de-annex, and those things are all going to be addressed in feasibility study. So Tom Cloud has suggested there was a statement that he prepared and sent to you, Mayor, and I believe you sent it out, that you do not come up with or try to think about things that are going to happen in the future if the de-annexation does occur, because we just don't have those facts right now. The facts will be addressed in the feasibility study, so it would kind of be um, guessing at this point to give them answers and to commit to anything for the town. I'm sure it depends on the size of the town, but it give you an idea of the size of our town and how long this study would take? Oh, we, the study is, you are allowed to up to six months in the statute, but we have requested that it be done within 60 days or so. I was asking what that study incorporates, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the feasibility of not having the property within the town anymore. So it's going to be done by a woman who Tom has worked with in the past. She's a planner and an attorney, and she's very good. 
No, I, I know you said a lot of residents have questions. This is something new, new to us, new, new to me at least. Um, is it possible for the residents to have questions, maybe even using people to send them in somewhere to the people doing the study? Maybe they, this way it's possibly can be answered in a report if it must make it. Sure, I think the most appropriate time to answer the questions will be when the report is done, but if you do have questions, we can, I mean, I, we can send them to the lady that's going to be preparing the report, but I think it's, it should, the report should be addressing the core questions that they do have. Okay. Why am I paying to tell people how to leave my town and stop paying taxes? It makes no sense to me at all. Unfortunately, it's a requirement of the no. statute. So, but that doesn't mean that if a, if a resident has a question about what if they stay in the town or can we work on this, can we work on that, that I mean, those are just all town issues that should still be addressed. Anybody have any other questions on that? No, I know the, uh, Mr. Ms. Fran Wagler put a meeting together at the library and brought uh, Carrie Baker in. I know he answered a lot of questions, so the people that couldn't make that, uh, Carrie, I'm sure you can make himself available. Um, he's on the website. You can email or call him if you have any questions as far as your taxes. And he, he was very informative uh, during that meeting. Okay. Um, I believe his question was, would they revert to the county if the de-annexation is successful? Is that correct? Yes. And I believe that is, is what would happen, that it would... That's correct. You're either in the county or out of the county. You're, you're in, yes, you're either in the town or out of the town. Exactly. Yeah. And then the memo that I prepared and we circulated was a compilation of a couple folks at our firm. They did some research and we have a couple First Amendment rights attorneys that we talked to about the process that occurred at the last meeting. Um, you have, and the mayor addressed this at the last meeting, a very strong form of government, mayor form of government in the charter. And the town's charter it provides that the mayor has the power to establish the agenda for town council meetings, to call special meetings of the town council, to attend and preside at all meetings of the town council, um, to be the head of town government for all purposes, to be the official spokesperson of the town, and to direct and supervise the administration. Um, she is the boss of your employees and to investigate the condition of the town and the town's department and offices. She is your chief executive officer and maintains order at all regular and special meetings of the council. And in her absence, the mayor pro tem, he is the one who maintains order at regular and special meetings. The mayor has decided, um, as part of her process of setting up the agenda, that she will establish the agenda by taking um, suggested agenda items from the council and there is no specific outline of this process anywhere it's just that is the process that the mayor is using right now there is no specific Supreme Court case which addresses when the free speech rights of elected officials in the context of open meeting law. There are some lower court cases that we looked at, and all of the cases do agree, and the judges did agree, that the one thing that a presiding officer at a meeting cannot do is viewpoint, is discriminate on, on someone's viewpoint. So for instance, if you're having a discussion about, say, Ron von Frankenstein's contract, which we did, you can't say to someone, okay, you're not allowed to speak against it. Well, I'll hear from everybody that wants to speak against it, but not allowed to hear from the other side. So that's, a, that's viewpoint discrimination. But there is the ability of the presiding officer to um, treat, they do have to treat all counselors similarly, but they do have the ability to 
preside at the meeting and maintain decorum and decide what is going to be discussed at the meeting that if it's pertinent to town business. So a couple of the things that I put in the memo that came from the case law that we reviewed were that the mayor, in this instance and in all other instances, the presiding officer, whoever you call them, in open meeting situations, can require members of the town council to adhere to rules of decorum and define the discussions of the, to the purpose of the meeting. The mayor can call a councilor out of order for being disruptive and not addressing agenda items. They can prevent a councilor from speaking repetitively on a subject. They can prevent badgering, interruptions, and disregard for the rules of decorum. They can remind a counselor of a topic if he or she veers off of the topic and give a counselor another opportunity to address that topic if she chooses. Be proactive. Actually, one of the things we suggest is that the mayor be proactive to stop angry emotions and disruptive actions because that has the ability of high, or the end result of hijacking somebody else's ability to speak at a meeting. And in this instance, I know this council has used Robert's Rules of Order, and those are widely regarded by many courts in the, across the United States. And I did get a couple of questions, specific questions, on the memo. One being um, the, how the mayor is able to select the agenda items. And I think that in this instance, everything basically that this council does, I mean, you can arguably say deals with town business. But you have to have a, an end goal about what, or where you want to go to in a meeting. You need to have enough time to address specific items. And the items need to be pertinent to the town council business, not like to the uh, the powers of the mayor to be administratively in charge of employees. <clears throat> and then some other questions were, um, how can I get called out of order um, at a meeting? And again, that's just because the mayor needs to keep the topics in line, and she needs to keep the business moving forward. And then, um, if the mayor refuses to put my items on the agenda for town business. In this instance, you have a very strong mayor form of government, like we discussed. And there's two options. You can change your charter, or you can have somebody else run your town as the mayor. But along that line, um, the folks that I spoke with in my office who practice First Amendment rights and constitutional law said they listened to the recording of what happened last week and were in agreement that the meeting was run efficiently and to the best of the mayor's ability. Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, when I got your, your memorandum here, I before I got it, I actually gave you some case law. And, and I never got a response to it. Um, and like you said, there's a lot of case law out there uh, throughout the country. And a lot of case law in different states don't have what we have as far as the Florida, um, the Sunshine Law. So obviously the rule is going to apply a little different there. Um, so as far as you're saying that they thought the meeting was run properly, if you look at the items I was bringing up, and it specifically says if you're talking about town business, like you just said, if there's an end game to it, you can't be stopped. And the topics I was talking about um, had an end game, and they were town business, and I was stopped. So um, if you, if your firm thought that was proper. I would love, um, if they would, just put in writing and just state that, you know, you agreed on how that meeting was run and that, um, me in particular, my rights weren't violated. Like I said, I sent you the, not <coughs> the passage uh, agenda items, but all my agenda items had something to do with town business. Um, 
they have an end game, if they just address them and entertain them, we can move forward and they won't be brought up again. So, um, and, and one of the questions I asked you, you cited a lot of things from the charter, the ordinances and the policies. And I sent you an email, and it's one you didn't return to me, um, which I, which is another issue I'm going to bring up as far as you're addressing other councilmen and mayors and emailing them and not emailing email me back. Um, as far as establishing the agenda, you said the mayor has determined that members of the town council should submit topics they wish to discuss at upcoming meetings. That's not written anywhere in the charter. That's not written anywhere in the ordinances. I'd like to know where you got that from. Um, you're citing case law here, but it doesn't say anywhere in there that she can do that. And I hope further goes, in that case, the mayor determines during the meeting whether the topic is germane to town business. Once again, um, we got to be very careful there because we can't infringe on the councilman's right. We do represent our constituents. They do have concerns. And everything I've brought up is town business. So um, to call me out of order when, I'm, when, I, when I got the floor, we talk about Robert's rules, councilman's comments, and, and that's acceptable. Um, Call me out of order when I talk about town business. That's, I have better things that's to unacceptable. Do. And for you to, instead of addressing the problem, it seems like you're trying to cover up for the wrongdoing. And I just wish you'd be a little more fair with it. Like I said, I, I've seen the emails back and forth. And not returning my emails is a clear sign to me that. Uh, you're, you're not playing favoritism, but taking care of someone more than others in the council. Councilor, and I have so emailed you more than any councilor okay. or the mayor, and I have all the public records to show that. Okay. So respectfully, that is not correct, and you did give me two cases. One was a 1966 Supreme Court case, which dealt with a House of Representative person who gave, I read all of these cases, mm -hmm. who gave a interview before they were even seated on a phone to your reporter, and that reporter just took the interview, gave it to the person who was going to seat the House of Representative person, and that person did not, and this person was even, I mean, this was a very antiquated case, the person did not get seated and sued. Okay. So it has nothing, I mean, the context is completely different, and when you look at First Amendment rights, you have to look at the actual context of the forum. You cannot just find cases. I agree. And I respectfully read all of your cases, the two cases that you sent. Okay. Well, I they sent three. Fit. They did the open mouth, uh, open meeting case for Ohio that did fit. It specifically states there, an elected official, you have to treat his rights the same as a citizen. And they talk about the meeting. I sent that there. I actually, I wrote, I wrote not only the case law, but I put the sections in there that state. So you're picking apart certain areas that might benefit the mayor. But you got to read the whole case, and you don't. So, but with this, I asked you, where you got this from? And you don't? And I, I answered the question. I said, that comes from the powers that are derived from the mayor. Your charter is not a procedural manual. You have to have some powers derived. Okay. Such as the fact that the mayor is the boss of all employees in this town. No, no, no. I know that, but I'm just saying in the charter it specifically says the mayor is the administrative head of all the employees in this town. So she oversees all the employees. So it's not a it's not a procedural manual how to do things, but she has to come up with a way to her process. Sure, and I agree to that. But when someone and a council member has an item, a town item to bring up, uh, town business, a report, whatever you want to call it, you're saying she can look at that town business. <coughs> And determine its business, but it's not germane enough Absolutely. to bring it up, but it's town business. So if you have people addressing issues to certain council members and they want to vote up a council meeting, like you're saying the mayor can stop that councilman from bringing that up. No, they can't. They can't. So please, like I said, you, you didn't say anywhere in here, and I highlight these areas where she can determine that. You point out the other areas where she can do it. 
the charter or is it a place you didn't put anywhere in there where I she can do it? agree. That is the process the mayor has come up with. Well, thank you. So she came up with it. There's no law on it. There's no there's no process, Robert's rules, nothing. She decided on her own to come up with that process, correct? That's a problem. And I can't, and it's sad that you don't see that's a problem as our attorney. And I, I wish you'd start representing us all equally. Councilor McGill. Thank you. Councilor McGill, if I don't agree with you, I'm fine with that. You don't agree with me. But treat, treat me the same. Please, everybody. And I, like I pointed Councilor out to McGill, you. I think you've made your Okay. Okay. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Conroy. I didn't have any on my agenda, so. Councilor McGill? Yes, uh, you know, Mayor, I got your email forwarded by, from Rebecca about the certain items. What I'm going to do is, I'm not going to talk about them. I'm just going to say that I want to talk about this, but I'm going to give you the email All right. and give you an opportunity to address it. Um, I'll send you an email along with uh, Heather, that would be great. and then we'll go from there. Thank is that you. fair enough? Okay. Yeah, I just needed more information and about the scope of what you were Yeah, going to do. and I got it today, and it was like last minute. And it was actually, yes, that was my issue. I had it in my drafts and had never sent sent. And I apologize. No problem. That's why I have no problem sending you the email. And then if we can address it between uh, then and the next meeting, yes. I'll be satisfied with that. Great. And we'll move on. Um, we talked about uh, the strong time air charter. Um, you might so you're addressing with it. that in the charter review yeah, process? Yeah. All right. The next thing is um, the mayor pro tem and you know the town charter and the ordinances and how it spells out the responsibilities. and. Um, is it, I mean, I know I was told in the past, and actually when Mayor Neville became mayor, we were given out the responsibilities, and one of the things I wanted to do was um, meet with the department heads, but I was told it was Mayor Pro Tem's responsibility. So would you address that? Yes. Thank you. Um, FTC? I sort of always found it ironic that the mayor wasn't the person meeting with the department heads, since... I'm responsible for the administration, and they report to the mayor, the mayor me at this point. Um, so I took copious notes and provided the information, and still a lot of things fell through the graphs. So when I became interim mayor, I discussed with the de department heads whether what they thought about me retaining the department head meeting um, so that... I could really understand and continue to have the information to manage the activities within the town. And so I think that ongoing, um, it would be behoove the town for me to continue to be at that meeting. Um, I'm still taking copious notes that are shared with everyone. The um, previous mayor had a full-time job, and I think that was one of the components of it being part of the mayor pro tem function. When I became mayor pro tem, I got a call from Mr. Neville, who um, I don't think uh, wanted to do it anymore. And so that's why I thought it was a function of the mayor pro tem seat. Okay. So Because I just want to make sure, I know Mr. Conroy travels a lot, as I do. And it wasn't a fact that he couldn't attend it because he was traveling, and that's why you're taking it over? No. Okay. Um, we were talking about the raises back and forth with the councilman. They talked about why a councilman got a certain amount and the mayor pro tem. And that one of the main reasons was because they're obligated to meet with the department head. So it's an extra meeting, extra meetings throughout the month they have to. That's a very good point. So are we going to adjust that because he's not meeting with them anymore? Because that was the reason why they got a little extra more money. It is probably a valid point. I have no problem with it. Yeah. Um, so when I moved, I think if there's any cost to the. Charter review. Charter review. And so it should be because there may be there you some go. legal costs that I'm quite willing to have all costs and turn in their paychecks. Right. So, okay. yeah. so, so we can I, put that <laughs> at the next meeting. I'll put that on the list to um, look at the salaries and also understand if we can, um, we'll reach out to the supervisor of elections to understand the components of the um, expense that we may incur depending on how we handle the referendum for the charter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the, I mentioned on here the attorney contract. It's actually a lot of the contracts within the town. Uh, Tom, the, um, uh, 
Town Planner. Town Planner, thank you. Uh, how often do we put that out for a uh, for bid, or how often do we address that? I know there are yearly contracts. Um, I know Heather's contract, she gave me hers in the beginning of the year when I asked for it. I think that was drawn up in 2008. Very old. We serve at the pleasure, I serve at the pleasure of the council, or Gray Robinson does. Yeah, so, I mean, I know a lot of councils address these contracts, subcon you know, contractors outside. And as far as I've been here, I haven't heard anything as far as putting the RFPs out for Tom or whoever. Right. I, I do not believe that we do the RFPs as regularly, but I do believe that we do a biannual, every other year, review of the contracts um, to confirm uh, the necessity that the, all of the skill sets are available. Um, I, the, the contractor wants to continue serving the town. Um, so I will contact Darian, or when she comes back in, we'll look at the calendar and see when those last reviews were. Yeah, I, I know this was brought up uh, at the beginning of the year when I got Heather's contract and other contracts. And I thought it was important just to show the people that we're not just sticking with the same company and not revisiting their contract or looking at other options. And, you know, it's also important with the, this latest budget we had and raising our budget, 180000 and uh, with the latest audit report, and uh, the way we got um, <laughs> we got scolded in that report as far as uh, the way we handle town business, I just thought it was important to start um, start looking up different contracts throughout the, from Heather on over. So um, maybe it's something we can address. I mean, last year I think they brought up or year before they brought up towards the end of the year. Yes, actually it was uh, it was Mayor Sears at that time yeah, yeah. that talked about uh, the review of the contract and the continuation of it, uh, the skill sets, the knowledge of the town. There were several um, things to look at, uh, including the price, so, uh, the cost. Excuse me. Yeah, so it's hopefully, like I said, I I'm bringing it up. I don't want to keep bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Can we address this, or can you address this? Yeah, like I said, I'm going to talk to Darian about the review of the town contract, see when the last yeah, reviews were. And you can let me mm -hmm. Okay, rather than me bringing it up. Yeah, I'll just um, add it to the uh, okay. agenda for November 19th. Okay. The, I put the golf carts on there. The, um, about state laws, and Heather sent me an email asking to get a little more specific on it. And... Once again, there's some complaints in Venezia being stopped uh, by a female officer, and one of the complaints was they were stopped because they had kids in our golf cart. And the officer said, I don't think this is legal. Um, so you might not want to do it, and, and went on her way. And after that happened, I guess it got around the community they're a little concerned that ha that occurred. So I believe one of the residents uh, met or talked with Chief Thomas about it. And I think there's a misunderstanding in the laws because I believe the resident was told in order to operate a golf cart, you have to have a driver's license or at least be old enough to have a driver's license. And that's not true. Right. So, so they were told that. Can I, um, do you have some details on that for us, Chief Thomas? I do. First of all, I never spoke to nobody in Venezia about the golf cart. Perry Davis? It doesn't match the state law now. 
we need to go back and revamp the ordinance. There are several inconsistencies inconsistencies on the ordinance. Okay. So my recommendation is we need to go back, review the ordinance to match the laws. Look at the current state statutes and Correct. go from there. And I have done quite a bit of research on this today. Well actually thank you Ms. Ramos. Uh, we did find a new well a newer uh, attorney general's opinion on regarding golf carts and child restraints and etc. Unfortunately, I didn't get to read that 100% before I came I haven't over. read any of it either. Okay. So if it's okay with you, we can have time to read this. And yes, absolutely. And come back with some sort of a recommendation yeah, for the revision of the ordinance so that our ordinance matches the state statutes. Okay. okay. I appreciate that. because, And then obviously there's a disagreement that he didn't talk to Perry. So I'm going to have Perry Davis. If it's okay, contact you and say exactly what was said between them. Uh, per Perry Davis did t uh, talk to us about being able to egress through the back yeah. uh, with the golf carts. I'm just saying, he, the concern came to me that he also said um, the kids or young adults couldn't be on it and you had to have a driver's license. And but I don't think Chief Thomas is included he, in that Once again, that's something he said. I'll have him contact you just Please. to confirm it. That would be great. Yeah. I would like just to refresh one thing. In Mr. McGill's original email, he says targeting. We are not targeting the residents of Venice. I would like to make that clear. Thank you for that clarification. Um, okay. Next. State law and pension. Yes. Um, after the last one. Mr. Scooter, would you accept a comment? What's that? Would you accept a comment? Oh. I always do. I, okay. I'm, no, I, I, with, I'm trying to be. Any, any time during my. Um, for the record, anytime during my council and comments, hey, to, the, to the town itself, you can speak. Um, I think it'd be um, a lot of times somebody brings a councilman a problem, they should be encouraged to talk to the department head or the mayor because they don't operate under sunshine. And then when it always comes up through a counselor, um, it seems like it. It's not as authentic as, you know, somebody told me, because I have people tell me stuff all the time, and you have to say, well, if you really feel strongly about it, then you should really go to the mayor. Because we, we do, we have the sunshine kind of cripples us in terms of uh, transmitting. You can't talk to the mayor, per se, without a meeting anyway. So hey, my point is that we should encourage if, if our constituents have an issue, they should be willing to put their name on it, Write it down, and then then we have something written from a constituent, rather than and the concert can be copied on it. I'm you know I'm not trying to restrain anything, but it just opens up the communication, to, in my opinion, uh, much better than simply always passing something through a council. Because that's the first thing I'll ask somebody. Well, have you talked to the mayor? Have you talked to the chief? Have you? And then and uh, the only problem you ever get burned is they drop somebody drops the ball. I'm not saying you drop the ball, but. I, just a comment. Okay, and I appreciate that. And it's, it's um, I, I just don't want to discourage the residents from approaching any of us because we should all be uh, available to them to answer their Hopefully questions. I suggest no, and only that they really have a concern. But we can should rise to get to the correct person. Sure, and if our town runs, but if they approach any of us, and they might feel more comfortable with one than the other. And they might feel comfortable approaching one of us rather than a department head because they might not want retaliation, or and they might want to remain anonymous. You know, it'd, be, it'd always be nice to um, have I don't someone like anonymous myself. Oh, and so do I. I don't think you do either. No, I know you don't. Yeah. So, but um, we should people have that right though. So, but even if they do report it to us, we can always forward it to Mayor McFarland and just obviously do not reply to the email like we always do at the recommendation right. of our attorney. So yes, and, and the more information, the better. So that um, these are lessons learned, right? So when we have a, a, a resident who has an issue, we do due diligence, look up the state statutes, look up um, the conflict in the ordinances, and do documentation. If we have that and we have that documentation, in the future, if the same thing happens, we are then able to draw on that knowledge and not redo everything every time. So that is key to our success. Being as small as we are and it, as limited on staff and resources, it's very key for us to make sure that we maintain that sort of documentation and line of uh, responsibility information logic. Okay. 
And with the golf carts, I guess Darian's still working on waiting for a response. So Yes, the FDOT has not gotten back to us on the variants yet. I emailed the guy, I kept his number just to get it. Great. And uh, they said they're still working on it. And um, so I figured... We're shooting for the Christmas. Festival. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, you get the ordinance back to me. Do you yeah. mind? Do you mind if I speak on this? What? No. Please. <laughs> no. Like I said, my my biggest thing with this whole thing is uh, I don't know what was said, what wasn't said, but when you have an officer thinking they know the law instead of knowing the law, that's a problem. Yes. If you don't say something to somebody unless you know the law, because that's just going to get you in trouble. Right. Yep. I don't know who it was. I don't care who it was. I up to the chief to handle and take care of, but. It's not a fact of, I think, it's, you know. That is, again, a very good um, point uh, that the chief will be able to take back not only to that officer, but all of his staff. So it's a very good point. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a recommendation. I know I brought this up the last couple meetings. Um, and to save time for me bringing it up, and it's about the chief's 11 offenses. If you are investigating and you are addressing them, maybe you can, once something's done, you can update the council via email. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think we should all, we're all entitled to be informed and keep, keep up to date on what's going on. This way also, I don't have to keep on coming here and asking you well, what's the latest and what's going on. And so, um, I am addressing them. The audit is one component of that. And um, my objective is to put these to, to rest. As the, uh, many of them were, were administrative and I address them. And so the last couple that I have um, will be reported on. Some of them are not appropriate to, to come back and, and be reported on because they are administrative functions of the town, uh, deal with confidentiality of information and personnel in our personnel policy. So how does other council members find out as far as what's going on? As far as I will, I'd like yeah. to pose that to Heather as far as are we entitled to know <laughs> what's going on? As far as the investigator, what's going on and information? I would. I think we need to wait and see what the mayor what the mayor does. And I, I don't know the answer to the question because I don't know what the result is. Okay, I'm just the question is, um, are we entitled to be informed where we're at as far as the offenses, the investigation, if there's any dispositions? I sent you an email, I never got a response. Because as I far didn't as have a, an answer. Okay, so we must have an answer for it. Um, and I think, like I said, it, I'm the one to type them up. And there's certain people that, victims, witnesses, whatever, haven't been interviewed. And um, they're even asking, uh, is it going on? Um, we haven't been interviewed. You know, when you conduct an investigation, if you look at the email that um, Deborah, is it LaFour? 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 Um, she sent saying what she would estimate if she investigated it. Anywhere from five to $9,000 it would cost the town for the uh, that law firm. Debbie and whoever to investigate it, and because you have to interview people, you have to take statements. So, so I am looking at them all. I have put several of them to bed. They were administrative functions, and um, with the, the <coughs> personnel directly, there are a couple that I'm still working on, and I will that are appropriate to report back on, and I will make sure that that happens. Okay. Like I said, I figured I'd make a recommendation with, with the emails. Just to, okay. I, I don't, like I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with letting us know what's going on. Um, and then the other thing was the George Brown on a May 7th. You said you, you acknowledge that you got the um, the fourth sheets, the forms, summer time sheets, summer vacation sheets, whatever. Right. So um, at that point, the instruction from the mayor was that the police handle their comp time internally. And so... Um, they, they have comp time for when they go to the courthouse, etc. So there's many of those. And so the complex that you reported, we went back and looked at the, the timesheets. And at that time, I talked to Officer um, Roman was the one. Is that correct? He was, he, he was keeping track of the comp time um, in a... It was official, but it was not documented well. Um, I don't know exactly how to say that. He knew exactly <laughs> what the comp time was, but it wasn't reflected on the time sheets as comp time in some places. Sometimes they knew they had four hours of comp time, and so they worked five hours and reported nine. And so that is something that the chief and I have talked about rectifying so that okay. comp time is identified as comp time, not only in the log where they um, 
have a running total of it, but so when they they fill out their time sheets, it specifically says hours worked, comp time, so that we know the differentiation between the two. Yeah, I, I want to put this to bed. Um, so let's. I, I just want to make it clear, the four time sheets, the one. I know the four. The one time sheet they submitted, um, which we've been we've been criticized by the auditors, uh, that they had to put the times exactly that it worked, and they only put eight hours or twelve hours. That is that is actually a, a an audit finding, right? We actually have to change all of our time sheets yeah. to do that because but, all yeah. of our hourly workers, not only our police staff but the town yeah. hall staff, etc., um, should be identifying the dates and times. But this and has been so, going on, and I know Mayor Sears warned the police department that they had to start doing that when he was mayor. And they, they still aren't. So it's, the reason I bring it up is the timesheet showed 12 hours that he got paid for. And if you look at all the timesheets throughout the year, that's where they indicate comp time. And no comp time was indicated on there. Right. And so, it, was, it was an error of omission, absolutely. But then he got the, his police log said he worked eight, seven, eight hours. Yes. And then another sheet showed he was on vacation. And then, oh, and then he taught at the academy for seven hours. So, right. and this is something that you brought up before. So we we do yeah. have the background on it. And like I said, I'm working with the chief to make sure that the timesheets are adjusted and delineated. We haven't done it. We are looking at the new fiscal year component and how to get that addressed. I appreciate it. Like I said, I just I want to put this to bed. It's um, I appreciate the information you gave me. Um, the, the resident slander and council members. I can send you an email on that. Great. Is that fine? I think that was one of your questions. Um, the false statements made that you asked on um, in more detail. Um, I think I put two dates to September 23rd meeting and October 14th. Um, at that meeting, I asked you if anything was any disposition was done on any offenses. You said none was done. Nothing was. Nothing was concluded. I listened time. to the meetings. I did not recall yeah. hearing that. Um, yeah. No and work is it? Well, the reason why I say it because I, there's an email between you and Heather saying that uh, you can disregard offense number ten. I'm going to put a letter in the chief's file. Yes. But I, when I asked you, you said nothing was done at that I'm time. I'm still working with Darian. She is out, um, and so she and I have got to sit down and work through. Oh, so that's so that's not number ten. Okay. Yeah. I just, so the I'm email still, said that's why I want to bring I'm it up. I'm still working on that. Okay. Like I said. Okay. All of the. Uh, uh, so, the inappropriate email regarding violation of rights, I sent out an email and I figured we can address it that way, so I'm not going to bring it up like I promised you. Uh, we talked about the building inspector. Uh, the timeline, First Amendment rights, uh, like I said, I'll address it in the email for you. And then we can hopefully um, um, address it the next meeting, put that to bed. Um, the, the Larry Chester and um, well, people are asking, you know, Lieutenant Roman's old car, it's being taken home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about the budget and the spending, the extra money and all that, and um, I, they're asking who's taking it home. I'm assuming Larry, Larry Chester is. Yeah. Um, but him being a part-time uh, temporary police officer, taking home a police car, and someone would say, I don't, I'm not sure, he was 25, 30 minutes away, back and forth, is... This is a common practice. Are we allowing part-time officers to bring our township cars home? I'll look into it. We have uh, previously done that. He is doing uh, a lot of work as lieutenant as far as the um, some of the administrative functions because we are currently um, one full-time police officer down and three reservists. Is that correct, Chief right. Thomas? So. Um, it is appropriate at this time for him to be able to have that car and utilize it because he is filling in um, and providing backup as uh, for the administrative function. Okay. Um, so you know about it. Yes. Did you get permission, I guess, in writing? No, not in writing. Okay. Because the ordinance says it has to be in writing from the mayor. Our laws say it has to be in writing. We'll do that. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, the slandering I told you, I email you on, um, update on the Don Ellis, and the new information was, and I, at the last time I, I mentioned that you went to the Sheriff's Department, we addressed it, uh, just found out it, uh, after you went, Conroy went down there to try to reopen a case against Mr. Ellis about the false report, and uh, they wouldn't even open it. They said no. 
Um, we're not opening this. We're not even going to entertain it. Okay, good. So, okay. just you know, I don't know if you're aware that Mr. Conway went down and no. also gave a statement against Mr. Ellis. No, I wouldn't. And the sheriff's involved in that. I wouldn't know that. Wait, so. You're a mayor. I figured you would. We got one of that. You stand corrected. I didn't ask them to open it at all. I said they didn't open it. I didn't say you asked. Oh, okay. No, yeah. there was they didn't. No. In there, right? no, you went down um, four I, days after the, three days after the September meeting. And I, I am not part of a corrupt Howie government. I didn't. And you attacked both the mayor and myself in, mayor? in emails and on postings. And I would like an apology that I simply did my job. And How did you do I, your job? Well, so I, I'm, I'm okay. late. May I? Okay. No. You can't. Thank you. I can't challenge your honesty. Honesty? As a matter of fact, I'll read the emails for you. I'll read them out loud to the public if you want. Because they're dead on. It's so obvious what you're doing, Mr. Conroy. I see all the emails. You see all the emails between... The chief, you, Martha Nebel. Nothing to John Scott or I. I think We're always being left out. It's, it's the three of you. So how are you defending that? So I'm simply, I send, I'm simply I saying... I an email and I send it to Rick and I say, for your information. I'm simply saying, Mr. Conroy, that you went down after Martha went down. I'm sorry, Mayor McFarlane. And tried to uh, sway the Sheriff's Department... Because why else would you go down there and give a statement? May I read my statement? Rather than... May I, may I read my statement? I don't, yes, he can. So he finishes. Rather than looking into the allegation on him making a false police report against an 83-year-old man. Okay. Rather than doing that, you went down and tried to go against Mr. Ellis. But read your statement. Okay. You keep using the word false, and nowhere in the sheriff's report was it false. However, the statement, after I heard that Martha had a similar situation... I called the officer and I said I would like to make a statement about Mr. Ellis. Based upon Mr. Ellis visiting my house in November 2018 post-election. Shortly after the election, Mr. Don Ellis came to my home, not to congratulate me, he ran against me a few people uh, maybe don't call that, but to further discuss the stalking incident of Mr. Ellis's granddaughter that occurred approximately, I think it was 4 4 18, about six months earlier, and to complain about Chief Thomas's action at the time. He reviewed his version, Mr. Ellis reviewed his version of the alleged stalking and said the chief should have stopped this guy under some pretense to find out what he was doing in Howard. I had already talked, I had been previously informed of the incident. And I had asked the chief one simple question. I think everyone in the audience would ask a chief or a councilman the same question. Did, chief, did you follow the law? Chief is not allowed to choose which laws, hopefully, which he, we, he wants to enforce. The chief replied that he followed the law. Mr. Ellis replied he did not care that the chief followed the law that he was a law officer, that when he was a law officer, and by the way, he was in Orlando, I know it's Orlando or, or Orange County, uh, that his philosophy, you do as a chief, as a policeman, whatever it takes. And my, by the way, my wife overheard parts of this conversation, so I, she's my witness. Had he taken the law in his hand, and that he had actually taken the law in his hands at time when he was on duty in Orlando. He said he knew that I was a supporter of the chief, but he, Don Ellis, was out to get the chief and was not satisfied how this incident was handled. I told him the chief followed the law. That's all I could ask. Mr. Chief, Mr. Ellis proceeded to angrily leave my house and left saying I was stupid. As to, later in another email, Mr. McGill, as challenging the integrity and honest of Mayor Martha McFarland, I found it very disrespectful and dishonest on the part of Mr. McGill. Am I, too, making up a story about a witness other than myself? I think not. It's come to my attention, even the FBLE report Mr. Gill had filed against the chief, without the mayor or the council's knowledge, which he once denied, 
he stated the FBI was aware that Mr. Ellis was following the chief. Finally, to all the to all of you, let me get some water. Mm -hmm. Finally, to to all of you who saw or listened to Mr. Miguel read offense number eleven, the sheriff's department once again found all the claims unsubstantiated in their words. I'd say that is a far cry from Mr. McGill's statement the chief filed a false police report. In fact, the sheriff's department advised that the alleged stalking was not a, was a misdemeanor stalking perhaps, and if it was a misdemeanor, it, would, it should be pursued, pursued by the state attorney's office and that it was not a felony offense. So with that, I left it, and I simply did my civic duty because I've had other neighbors tell me other stories about Mr. Ellis's, whether he was stalking or not stalking, or whether he was just kind of following the police chief, which was one report. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. I just wanted to make you aware that, I don't know if you knew that the report was sent, or the state was sent to the uh, Sheriff's Department. Uh, the other thing is the police study that we brought up for the Sheriff's Department. Um, that is the audit. If you look at the audit yeah. in there, read that through. It actually talks to several of your points. Yeah, but when, we, when I ask for the study, um, we get a cost to see what co uh, to cover the town. Ah, That's what I'm talking about. Oh, sorry. It's no problem. Um, and I... Uh, when I we had the last budget meeting, and I said right at the budget meeting, I listened to it again when uh, Mayor Nebel was Mayor Nebel at the time, yeah, said that um, get it in writing, and at that meeting I said yes, I'll go down to the sheriff's department and get a and get a quote or a study or whatever, just so we have an idea with the base and on. So we were all aware of it, um, and then I asked at that last meeting, um, the sheriff wasn't emailing me back that. You've been in contact, or the sheriff contacted you. I sent you the email. Um, it was actually the sheriff that reached out to to us, to to Chief Thomas, to make him aware that you had. Yeah, I knew that because you made it. The meeting said he reached out to you, and I knew. It didn't no, exist. I said we received a notification. But anyway, I listened to it today, and that is my recall recollection. Okay. Um, yeah, can we? I am. Uh, I had said at that point that we would do an internal impact analysis so that we would know what to ask for, um, and. It, that is something that has to be done with everything that we've got going on right now. I, I don't know if it can be done immediately, but we really do need to look at what are we going to ask for? Are we asking for you know six officers, two daytime, two nighttime? Are we looking? Are we going to do what um, Mineola does with outfitting all of them? Are they going to be here? Are they going to just be patrollers? You know what exactly do we need? And when we do do that, then we can determine the feasibility. You said that um, the sheriff had told you that um, he could do it for less, I believe you said? What's that? No, he gave an example. He said uh, what you need is at least one officer during the day, and he's recommending two officers at night. Right. Currently, we only have one, um, but he's saying for officer safety, he's recommending two. Right. Um, but with that, with that study, it's not going to cost anything. So he can come up with a number to show exactly. He'll do his own study as far as what we need, the manpower, how much it's going to cost, and he just presented to us. It's not going to cost us a dime, so we have an idea. When I saw him at the um, Florida League of Cities luncheon, he actually said to me that he didn't think he could do it for what we were currently paying. Okay. And so, um, again, I would I would like to determine what our current needs are. We have a police force that, that supplies us with um, not only the patrolling, which the sheriff's office doesn't really like to patrol right there. Yeah, well, so, yeah. And um, they patrol, they provide uh, services like um, you know, looking at houses while people are on vacation. They do check-in on our older citizens. They do many, many things that um, we are so lucky to have a small town and a police force that provides us with these other services. Sure, I just so, want to give those residents an option to show them and that when I talk to the sheriff, he was more than willing to give the study. So listen, it's not going to cost you a dime. We'll do it. This way you have an idea. But what are we asking for? That's my concern. What's that? I want to make oh, sure we're, we're asking yeah. apples to apples. Yes, and I told them that. I said, right. what, what do you provide for Neola? They have their own station there. I think it's 14 guys. I think their cost was like 
1.3 million, something like that. Mind you, uh, it's minimal. It's minimal. Right. Yeah. So yeah, he said, and, and he said, you're not even a third of what you would need in your town for Mineola. Right. So the um, the cost that was of concern to me is the one hundred twenty thousand dollars to outfit a deputy when they come in, because that's what the what was the number? One hundred twenty thousand. I was told sixty five, but okay. Okay. Well. You know, I have to go back and look. Now that I said that out loud, I could be, I yeah. could be. That's what I'm saying. If we had it in front of us from the um, sheriff, we wouldn't be like guessing or speculating or. Right. But I do want to know what we want to ask for, because just because they come back and say to us, yeah. we would provide this. This is what we think you need. I am hesitant to do that. And I would say to them, what we want is what we have right now. Can you match it? Can you save us money? Why do we tell them what we have? That's why we need he, an impact study to outline he, exactly what we have. He's the sheriff of this county. He, you know, he, he's the head law enforcement agent. He knows what we have and what we do. He sees a, a call volumes. The UCR reports. They know exactly, you know, what we need. I don't, I don't think he sees the. We check on um, Ms. Romano at the bottom of Magnolia every day to make sure that she's ambulatory, and and that's what our town is. That's the basic neighborly community that we are and I want to make sure that we continue that and have that in our scope and focus as well so. are we going to give them an answer though give who an answer the, the attorney for Lake County Sheriff's so they've been going back and forth with Heather well and it was it, one email yes yeah. I talked to him on the phone and Sorry. he had said I had asked for some follow-up information from the mayor because I got an email out of the blue from the attorney saying, hey, do you have time to talk? And I said, I have no idea what this is about. So I asked the mayor what it was about, and and um, the county's position is they don't want to get in the town's business until the town is ready for them to. Yes, and that's why they're waiting to see. They want a consensus exactly. from the town council first. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so you, you want to? I, I want to understand what we're going to ask for. And then come back and agree that well, that's what we're going to ask for. That's the scope of the work that we want them to bid on, and then go forward with that. Basically, full coverage for the town, um, patrolling the town, not just showing up because uh, a call had occurred, and uh, basically the services we have now. How much would it cost? Do we supply the cars? Do they supply the cars? They supply. Do cars. we supply the best? Well, but they, they, they don't. But they tell you all that though. When you, when they do that's what they want to know when we ask them for a bid. They want. They're going to come back to us and say. Do you want to supply the cars, or do you want us to supply the cars? Like they do in Mineola. Mineola supplies the cars. Okay. Mineola supplies the vest. Mineola supplies the body cams. You know, and so are we asking for them to do that, or are we going to continue to do that on our own yeah. and and outfit those? And then are those our deputies? Are they designated for Howie so that every day we see John Smith, and we know John Smith is yeah. our guy. We don't see John Smith and then Joe Blow and then Harry, you know. And everything you're asking, he'll provide. All we have to do is say, yeah, let's, let's, we have nothing to lose to show. They may, they may be more. We have nothing to lose by but asking. I've just given you a bunch of options, and you said, yes, they'll, tell, they'll do it. They'll answer that for us. So it's, okay. and we'll see on the paper exactly what we get. If we get the paper cards, the best, guns, whatever it may be, we'll, we'll see it. So I just, like I said, we have nothing to lose. We go to the residents. We complain about the taxes, how high they are, the village rate, and the cost of the police department. At least we can show them. What it's going to cost if we have to play kind of sheriff's commitment? It, it can't hurt. So, hopefully, maybe next meeting, uh, you can think about it. I know, but it's the simple, like I said, giving them a call, email, saying, yeah, go forward, come up with something. So, um, we talked about the annexation. Um, hopefully, maybe, uh, I know the residents were asking uh, why it wasn't, a couple asking why it wasn't on the agenda because it's pretty important item and th thank you for bringing it up. Um, maybe in the future if we talk about it, sure. we can I'll, put it on there so they can see. I can ask them or tell the mayor or ask the mayor if she can put my items on there so everyone knows. Especially that item because be. it's so... And I'll probably give an update on it frequently. Yeah, it'd be for them. <laughs> you know, cause like I said, there's um, a lot you know, of... It's completely out of fairness to the residents. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of questions out there and, and need to be answered, so uh, that's it. Councilor Scott, you didn't have anything, but do you have anything? 
I did well. I didn't want Tom to come here all the way from Volusia County and charges for. I know he doesn't charge us to come here, but he does charge us for his time to talk about the sidewalk that he was talking with the state about. The FDOT has not gotten back to us yet on that, and it also is not on the MPO plan yet. Um, we had done the bicycle study, and in the bike, the uh, okay. yeah, yeah, we had talked about making our sidewalks ADA compliant, providing on ramps and connecting the sidewalks to the edges of the road. That's all FDOT uh, right of way and responsibility, and um, it is the same with the discussion that we had uh, for the facade changes in the building. That that's FDOT sidewalk there and right of way, and um, we've got to uh, understand whether they are going to actually entertain that or not. I know that um, they had said that they may be able to do the connector sidewalks, the study for this connector sidewalk from Venezia to uh, uh, the sidewalk in front Lakeview. of the, yes, to Lakeview, thank you. Um, but we still haven't gotten any word back from them at all. No, I, didn't, I didn't want him to come here and just tell us, no, we, didn't, we don't have nothing. Yes, well, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, we are done. Um, Oh, April, I'm so sorry. You're here. <laughs> so, April, if you'll just introduce yourself to everybody and then if you'll go through it and brief. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, April Shipping, a partner with CRI, in charge of your financial statement audit. It sounds like you had a couple audits to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, I think you all have a copy, a bound copy of the financial statements. Um, I can go into as much painful detail on the numbers or as little as you prefer. <laughs> um, the key things that you uh, really want to know yes, is the key. Uh, it was a clean audit. We were able to give a clean opinion, which means we were able to say that the numbers presented in these financial statements are uh, materially correct. Um, there are no material misstatements. We have a reasonable assurance. So auditing has lots of wiggle words, but basically these are numbers that you can rely on as the accurate numbers for the town for the uh, year ended September 30th, 2018. We did have a number of findings this year, um, mainly internal controls that we thought could be improved. Um, we are required to um, uh, actually look at all of your controls over all your significant processes and let you know as governance when we think there are some improvements that could be made. Um, we do understand that we do a lot of small towns and uh, smaller counties, and when you have a very limited number of fiscal staff, it's very common that the cost-benefit of a control may not be there to implement it. We still have to say it's that, that there's a control deficiency, but um, a lot of towns will decide that it's just not cost-benefit to hire three extra people to double-check everyone's work. So I'm happy to go through those findings if you'd like, but it's not required. It's really at the pleasure of the Commission. So I have read through these. I don't really need any more detail on the findings. I just had a couple questions with okay. some of the findings. Go ahead. Yeah, seriously. Uh, you talk about pen. I know a couple things that you're looking at past was so repeat offenders on a lot of things. Um, and a lot of it has to do with training. And. Is there, but you don't come up, and I don't think it's your job, but the recommendations as far as how we can overcome that obstacle, as far as, because it's the same thing over and over. So, um, so if I, I can, happy to respond to that. Right now you have a town clerk who is primarily responsible for everything. Uh, and so the finances are a very small part of her daily duties. Um, and then you have a very, very part-time accounting person, uh, Russ, who is here, um, you know, well, hours. Monday, yeah, Wednesday, very, Friday, very, Friday, very Friday. limited <laughs> uh, time, which, you know, um, there's, there's really just so much people can do when you don't really have the resources. You don't have enough bodies who are putting the time in to, to do the work. So given the resources that your finance department has, it's absolutely reasonable that we would see these kind of control deficiencies. Um, to eliminate them, my recommendation would be either hire a qualified person on a 
closer to full-time basis to assist them, to assist Russ and Darian um, to be able to focus on some of this or get a consulting firm and another CPA firm to come and, you know, maybe add that layer of internal controls on a, on a part-time basis but dedicated just to finances. Again, it's cost-benefit um, that the, the town would need to decide if it's worth the extra cost to hire an additional person um, or to bring in a consultant to reduce the risk of these internal controls. Thank you. And real quick, the fines you're saying, the $500, how often is that? You said something about here, you can get fined for penalties. Are we being fined? You are not. Okay. No. No, no the state could do that. All right. Just the state wanna, has not. You know, and I have never seen the really state actually that, do it. So I, yeah. I've never seen the state do it, so. Okay. But it could. Thank you very much. I, really I have a question. Uh, why are we getting this report? October after a whole year's passed, and what can we do in the future to get it? What, what, what's that? All these other small towns, how long does it take to get their audit done? Six, six months. So the, this uh, requirement by the state is to have it done within nine months by June 30th. Um, that's a, a state requirement to the Auditor General. The real delay in this this year was your lack of, lack of dedicated staff. Darian was from our perspective, pulled in a lot of directions this year. And when Russ is here part-time two days a week, we'll ask for something on a Monday, maybe get it on a Friday, maybe it's not what we need, and then we'll have to ask for it again the next Monday and get another version on the next Friday. It really drags the process out. We had, um, actually I have a, a really short timeline, just to give you real numbers and not made up numbers in my head. Um, we were actually scheduled to start field work January 7th. We had worked with Darian on that to try to accelerate the audit and get it out sooner. Um, there's a very few basic things we need to start, and one is just a trial balance. It's a list of your accounts and the amounts in each one. Um, and the year before, we had come out and not had things ready, which had delayed the process, and it costs us a lot of money when we do that. Um, we didn't want to do that this year, so I, I basically said we can't come out until we have this. Um, and so every time that would get close, I'd give her a week's warning. I'd say, well, let's reschedule in two more weeks. We did that until, um, I think it was February 20th. So it was a month and a half that we had to reschedule our books to get your town's audit on our calendar with our appropriate staff every two weeks for six weeks to even get out here. And that was just with the basics available to us. Let's go. Um, needed a lot. So it's, it's not anybody's fault. It's not that anyone wasn't trying their hardest or doing really good work. Um, you know, I certainly don't want to sound like I'm throwing Darian under the bus as the least because she's been wonderful to work with. It's just a resource thing. When we sat out here for weeks and we could see she was pulled constantly to deal with other town business. And with I mean, normally we would see a full-time finance person that we could rely on. That, we, that would be the one that would go get us the bank statements we needed or things like that. And when Russ is only available half time, you know, half days, two days a week, it, it just really slows the process down. So that's more than half the reason, would you say? I would say that's 90% of the reason. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. We, you know, we, we were, we had appropriate staff, we had the time dedicated to it. What happens is when we get big delays during our block that we scheduled to be here, and we don't get to finish because we don't have everything we need, then we're fitting you in in other jobs. And so we don't know when the next piece of information is going to show up. Maybe it shows up next week, two weeks, and then we got to pull people back off to handle that and wrap it up. It's very, very inefficient. I will say that we took a ginormous loss doing this work this year. Um, it, uh, just because of how many times we had to pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down. It was incredibly inefficient. Um, and again, nobody's fault. It's a resource it's a resource problem. I think Russ and Darian do a wonderful job, and they do the best that they can with the resources that they have. Every year, financial requirements get more complex and more complex between the Governmental Accounting Standards Board and the Auditor General uh, and, the, and the state legislature. They put new reporting requirements, new um, compliance requirements constantly on small towns and you know giant counties alike, and they don't really understand those unintended consequences of making everything more complex. Thank you. Any um, other questions? No. I would entertain a motion to approve the audit. Any questions from the audience? Oh, maybe? well, we have to have a motion before we okay. do it. So, so moved. Second. 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 Do we have any questions on the audit from the audience? Get out of the way. <laughs> no? Then I think we should do a vote. Councilor Scott? Yes. Councilor McGill? Yes. Mayor McFarland? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Conroy? Yes. Motion. Thank you.
you very much. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed working with your town. Thank you. Yes. You have a card. So it is time for public comment. Have you filled out a board for it? Thank you. So I was caught off guard about the town council because I had asked Becca before we started if she would like me to add the Christmas festival to my list of the sunshine and happiness report. And so I should have given it all at my sunshine at, at the moment of town council. So I have a few things on my list. Um, if I may address the town. Yes, thank you. Three minutes. Three minutes. Tell me when. Uh, the Halloween Bash is this Thursday, Halloween. It's in front of the library. It's uh, from 5 to 7. Then it's followed by Trunk or Treat at a church, and that starts at 5.30 with the Boy Scouts. Uh, yard sale, I'm doing these in order so in case you're keeping track. The yard sale, town-wide yard sale, is this Friday. It's this weekend. We usually just do it Friday and Saturday. But if you want to be out there on Sunday, you can do it too. Um, the library will have yard sale in front of the library. Uh, friends of the library are participating. And if you want, if you live out of the town bounds and you want to bring a table, it's a $5 donation to the friends of the library Friday and Saturday. Okay? Number three is scouting for food. Um, the, drops, drop, uh, the boys will be putting out door hangers if they don't hit all of your town. Um, please make a donation. There are drop-off centers. If they put a door hanger, they'll be at your house. If they don't put a door hanger, um, it will, you can drop it off at Town Hall, the library, the community church, the Howie Market, or the real estate office at Mission Inn. Last week, I'd like to thank Mr. Scott and Mr. McGill for participating in uh, the county appraiser coming to talk to us at the library. Um, I, too, did not move here. I moved here from somewhere else, um, and I was wrong in what I was telling my students. Um, uh, I teach real estate, and so I wanted to pass along to you. I know everybody thinks that they pay too much in taxes. If you pay your taxes in November, you will save 3% of your tax bill. Tax bill comes at up 4%. 4, 4 in November. Three in December, two in January, one in February, no savings in March, and you're delinquent on April 1. And it should be out in your mailbox next week. Thank you for correcting me. Um, so if you want to save money, who doesn't need to save a dime? Okay. Number five is the Christmas Festival. It's December 13th and 14th. Check out the Howie Tribune for all information. And number six. Uh, we talked just one second about the cup, and the cup runneth over, and we're all going to be in big trouble and pay fines. I suggest that we make a contest, a cup contest, how much water you can save. Mr. Ernest told me one day that water cost one penny a gallon, including the tax. So if we want to save water, our money on our water bill, save water. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Next, please. Jojo Lowe. No, I didn't fill out one of those. Yes. Thank you, Fran. I, I only have two things to say um, because the Tribune might not make it out for a couple of events, and that one was the yard sale. And uh, please come join us if you live on a dirt road and you go, nobody's going to come out to my house, come to the library. Uh, we have a lot of fun. Right now we have three people signed up, plus us, that's four. We have plenty of room. Uh, we have a Medicare, uh, a Medicare presentation at the library on Tuesday. <laughs> Whatever that Tuesday is. Tomorrow, Tuesday, or no, the following one? The following one. So that would be, I believe, the fifth. If you have questions about Medicare, I forgot to look when I came up. Um, and we will not have a, a meeting of the town council before the next Meet the Artist, the third Friday of the month, and it will be the last one for the year. We will not have one in December, so mark your calendars for the 15th in honor of um, resident Judy Lutkus. Oh, my name. She was lost because she didn't have her phone. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry? 
Who else? Do we have another public comment? Yes. Mr. Miles? I have two different subjects that I Can want. you make sure that you use the mic, Mr. Miles? Okay. I have two subjects I wanted to bring up, and they may take a little bit more time than three minutes because they're totally different subjects. Uh, and a question for the mayor. May I address one council person? The council has a body. Um, can, that, can I direct my question to a particular council person? Yes. Um, but we do have to hold this at three mis minutes. So. Okay. Here we go then. <laughs> Councilman McGill, two weeks ago, you proudly proclaimed that you were elected by a majority of the voters who provided you a mandate to clean up the mess in the Howie <coughs> Town government. You ran for seat number one in November of 2018 against Christian Sears, the then mayor. The vote count was 379 for McGill, 347 for Sears, a difference of 32 votes. If 17 voters had changed their mind, Mr. Sears would have retained the seat. I don't find that to be a mandate by any stretch of the imagination. At the same election, Martha McFarland received 487 votes compared to 225 votes for Edward E. Smith, a difference of 262 seats. This truly is a mandate from the voters. I think the council recognizes when David Nebel stepped down as mayor. You voted five to zero to place Martha McFarland in the mayor's position. So far, she's doing a wonderful job. You would be well served to listen and learn from a master, Mayor McFarland, who has the voters' mandate, unlike you. Second topic, legal expenses. I've read the entire audit report this year. I saw what the auditor said. Most of the findings in there are related to the town not having a large financial staff. You don't have a finance director. You don't really have a full-time finance person at all in this town. However, in the legal area, during the last three years, fiscal year 16, 17, and 18, the average legal expenditures were $45,246. That's the average. Mr. Miles, your three minutes is up. Would you okay. like to give... I'm going to wrap it up. Can we give... This, this past no. fiscal year... Account, um, Mr. Miles. The total was $82,216. That's an increase of almost $37,000. Mr. Miles. Or 81.71%. That's enough money that you could hire a full time finance person to add Mr. into the staff. But instead, through your misfeasance and malfeasance, Mr. McGill, Mr. you've been Mr. running up legal bills that the people in this town do not want you to incur. Mr. Miles, please. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Yes, he asked me to ask me a question, and you allowed him. So if he asked me a question, no, then he said he could, could he address you. That's a question. He, he didn't I ask you a question. He addressed you, Miguel. Okay, but he's four minutes. He went four minutes. I know. Minutes. And I, I was trying to stop him. And he gave you false information. Oh. 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 Yes. Bit of that sir, sir, you're out of line. Mr. Miles. Sir, you're out of line, sir. Mr. Miles. As always, you're out of line. Counselor, oh. Counselor McGill. Oh. Counselor McGill. Everybody, please. Counselor McGill, I'll manage the meeting, please. So, thank you, um, uh, Mrs. Dreesen, Karen.
Karen Dreesen, 121 East Cedar. <coughs> Actually, thank you, Mr. Miles. I think your report was very well done, and I know it was factual. If you know this man's history, background, which some people here don't, but trust me, it was very factual. And there isn't much more that needs to be said about that report. However, I do have one more thing. However, sig insignificant Mr. McGill thinks this is. It will show everyone your lack of integrity. Your word means nothing. Things don't go your way in a meeting and bam! You drop out of assisting or participating with any holiday fest, uh, festival committee. You were responsible for orchestrating the classic show, the car show, the classic car show. You were responsible for that. He just left, gave up, walked away left people hanging. Because of your behavior and disloyalty to employees, many volunteers that work tirelessly to put on a great holiday festival. Not, of course, the previous mention of attorney fees. On behalf of many residents in the town of Howie, we demand your resignation. Yeah, Pat Miller, Lakeshore Boulevard. A few Venezia residents have indicated that they believe the rest of Howie does not want them here and that we think they are too upset over nothing issues. Well, I'm here to tell you that four or five people out of 1,100 or more do not speak for me. I do not feel that way at all. When I found out that there would be a new community in Howie, I was happy. It was fun to see the new homes go up and the new community come together. My thought was and is I was able to buy a home in Howie, so why shouldn't they? <coughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm not against development. Having a development that has many homes close together is not preferable, but development is inevitable. I welcome each and every one and look forward to having you help us organize events, attend library events, get involved in the town council, and staff positions. This town is not perfect, of course. No town is. They all have their issues. But living is easy and comfortable here. I came here kicking and screaming, but it has grown on me. <laughs> and really, many of the people who live here are just like you, trying to make a living and to be happy. Welcome to Howie, except, of course, anyone who uses scarfy language. Anybody else has any comments? Excuse me. If there are no more public comments, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.